The earth was once inhabited by the marine kingdom, an empire whose rivers and streams gave rise to life and vomited up the lands when the oceans were parted. Man's fate, however, resides in the depths of the abyss from which everything sprang. When the earth was baptized, the pit where they would be buried was filled with evil dregs. But not everyone died, some who swam did not drown, but instead survived and sought vengeance. In this video, I will explore the marine kingdom of the Nephilim in order to urge people to read the scriptures of the Bible and become more and more committed followers of God's word. Now, the bedrock must be laid before a castle can be erected, therefore we'll start there to understand what makes up this kingdom. According to Genesis chapter 1, God created the heavens and the earth in the beginning. The earth was formless and void at the time, and the deep ocean surface was dark. God then distinguished the light from the darkness and named the light day, while naming the darkness night. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And the first day began in the evening and dawn. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters to separate the waters from the waters, and God built the firmament and did just that. The firmament was named heaven by God, and in the evening and morning of the second day, God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together to one place, and let the dry land appear, and it happened. Genesis 1 verses 1 to 9 introduces us to God's physical and spiritual worlds, or to the physical, the seas before land. The depths were already firmly buried in the earth due to the lack of light when she entered her current shape. Because the Lord recognized that each stage of the Lord's creation was good, this did not make the dark evil. Lucifer, who lives in the shadows, had yet to wear a crown and fall out of favor, because what is good without God and his monarch? In six days, the Lord created the heavens and the entire earth, and on the sixth day, he created man in his image. During this time, Satan cursed the Most High and desired to reign on his throne. He used to be the one who could hit the high note, but he plummeted. He inherited the earth after being thrown from the skies like lightning for his disobedience. He disguised himself as a serpent in the garden and chose the weakest link to exploit. He launched his twisted words into Eve's ears as if from a coil. Eve believed his half-truths and ate forbidden fruit, Adam did the same, and the serpent's depravity spread to man. The Lord then decreed that you are cursed above all cattle and beyond all wild animals as a result of what you did. You must travel on your stomach and ingest only dust for the rest of your life, and I will sow conflict between you and the woman, as well as between your seed and her seed. It will result in bruises on both his heel and the top of your head. The prophecy of the serpent and the seed would not be fulfilled until Christ was crucified. In every way, Christ was the model of a sinless man, but it wasn't simply the purity of his conception that made him pure, it was also the purity of his blood. In the chapters that follow in Genesis, we discover what it means to be pure and how close the fallen were to accomplishing their goal. Chapter 6 of Genesis, for example, states. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all that they chose, and the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for he, too, is flesh, but his days shall be in one hundred and twenty years. There were Nephilim on the earth in those days, and after that, when the sons of God married the girls of men and bore children to them, the same became mighty men, men of renown. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all that they chose, and the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for he, too, is flesh, but his days shall be in one hundred and twenty years. There were Nephilim on the earth in those days, and after that, when the sons of God married the girls of men and bore children to them, the same became mighty men, men of renown. These are Noah's generations, Noah was a just and perfect man in his years, and Noah walked with God. 
Fallen angels are referred to be the sons of God in the Book of Enoch. The fallen have names, as do the deeds they carried out. According to the Bible, Noah's great-grandfather was Enoch. He was taken by God at the age of 365, rather than dying on the planet. The Context and Content of the Book of Enoch Examining the Hebrew language reveals how and why Noah was flawless, and why the flood was necessary because all flesh had been permanently contaminated. In verse 9, Noah is portrayed as upright and blameless. The Hebrew term for blameless is tamim. It denotes a lack of physical blemish and has the connotations of being free of blemishes, sound and free of spots, and unimpaired. The statement implies that Noah did not share the same genetic differences as the majority of Earth's inhabitants. Noah had no genetic changes caused by the fallen angel's invasion or entrance into the human species. Genesis 6 verse 4 describes the Nephilim as the outcome of the marriage of celestial seed with earthy flesh. This phrase now also alludes to the deceased spirits who formerly held the breath of life but drowned in the flood, as well as the massive children produced by the union of God's sons and men's daughters. The Nephilim defiled everything that walked, crawled, flew, or swam and came into contact with their wicked hands. According to Enoch chapter 7, they began committing sins against fish, reptiles, birds, and other animals, and they began eating and drinking each other's blood and flesh. Except for those who are in the sea, the Lord lists everyone who will perish during the flood. This implies that, while the sinful did go to the depths, those infected by the fallen remained uninjured and unpunished. Since the antediluvian period, man has merely scraped the surface of what lies beneath. More than 80% of our ocean is still undiscovered, according to reports, and we know more about space than the entire aquatic world. The lowest portions of the ocean are referred to as the Hutal Zone. The name was inspired by Hades, the Greek god of the underworld. Hades, Poseidon's brother, is a Greek sea god. It is no coincidence that the names of the planet's most remote regions are shared by the gods of the Old World, who many believe to be the antediluvian giants known as the Nephilim. They are a remnant, like their namesake, whose roots became stories, which became new deities. The biblical deluge left an indelible imprint on human memory, and the water that caused death came to be represented in a number of ways. Yam Nar, a Canaanite deity, is one example. They, like the Greeks, were gods of the sea, reflecting its awful nature. This sea deity had a sibling named Mat who, like Hades, was the Egyptian god of death. Canaan, the Nile's origin, was responsible. They are among the earliest Egyptian deities because of the regular flooding of the Nile, which brought elements such as clay and silt. He was regarded as the biological father of all human descendants. He would make the child out of clay on a potter's wheel, then place the youngster within a mother's womb. The final example is the Mesopotamian god Circea. He is commonly depicted with Shamash, the sun god. Shamash, an entity tied to the underworld, is another example of a sea creature associated with overseers of death. Circe's head typically has a serpentine or dragon-like aspect in paintings, indicating that the devil was implicated in the flood. Sea serpents are mentioned in the Bible as well. The Leviathan, one of the Lord's mightiest creations, is a creature mentioned in numerous writings and is said to be unkillable by man but a toy for God. The Leviathan is mentioned most frequently in the book of Job. Job teaches us that lifeless things, together with their occupants, are formed from beneath the waters. The Lord shows this primeval creature in amazing detail, giving Job an understanding of God's might and how the Lord supervises all movement, whether on land or at water. This implies that, while there is life in the waters, not all of it is alive. According to Deliverance Ministries, the term, Leviathan, refers to both a corporeal entity that has been described and a demon that resides in its host. 
The Leviathan spirit is frequently triggered by pride or, similarly to the Python spirit, by forgiveness that snakes around the person's spine in response to rejection. These demons, as well as others who resemble serpents, are part of a much larger group. Marine spirits, often known as water spirits, are a broad category of spirits. Water occupies 71% of the Earth's surface and 60% of the human body, according to the Bible, which explains how all creation, with a few exceptions, was wiped out by a flood. This suggests that these spirits can readily enter a human because we are not only surrounded by but also made of water. Despite mentioning their progeny, the Book of Enoch recounts 200 angels who conspired with Satan to corrupt the earth. It is unclear how many were produced. This is how people without Christ, who unfortunately make up a large majority of the world's population, can have several devils occupying them at the same time. In reality, we can see this happening during Jesus' lifetime. And they came over to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes, and when he came out of the ship, there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him no not with chains, because he had been bound with fetters and chains and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces neither. And he was always screaming and cutting himself with stones among the mountains and graves, night and day. But when he saw Jesus from afar, he went and worshipped him, crying aloud, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beseech thee, by God, do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit, and he asked him what his name was, and he replied, My name is Legion because we are numerous. And he begged him vehemently not to send them away from the country. Now there was a vast herd of swine feeding near the mountains, and all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine so we may enter into them, and forth with Jesus gave them leave. The evil spirits then left and entered the swine. And the herd dashed down a steep incline into the water. They numbered in the thousands and were engulfed in the sea. Several points are made plain in these passages. Jesus had arrived in the country by boat. He comes across a man who has been torn apart by a legion of demons here by the sea, near the marine realm. The devils quickly recognize Jesus as God's Son and are aware that their judgment is about to be carried out. Because it was not the day of judgment, they are oblivious of the moment when the devil knows the beginning but not the end. When Jesus possessed a herd of pigs, they dashed into the sea. The demon's purpose was not to continue feeding on these lesser hosts. Instead, they were told to use the pigs to transport the demons back to their kingdom. The serpent and the seed symbolism in Jesus' period was not limited to this event. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and go ahead of him to the other side, while he sent the multitudes away and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray, and when the evening came, he was here alone, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves because the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus appeared to them, walking on the sea, and when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were frightened, thinking, It is a spirit, and they screamed out in dread, but immediately, Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. As I previously stated, the Lord created heaven and earth in the dark since there was no light and the earth had no shape. Light, it is said, always triumphs over darkness. Jesus is the light of the world. In him, the word took on flesh. He was wandering over this vast chasm when his spirit floated over the seas during the age of creation. He now walks across its surface, slamming his heel into everything that lives there as well as the serpentine waves. He has defeated the dark of the deep, the things that have sunk to the bottom and await judgment. Those in the marine kingdom were formed against God's will. They are not permitted to enter either paradise or hell. Their home is the ground, and they live in the streams. The river is the root of wicked intents. They twirl and twist in anticipation of being beckoned by sin. 
The door has been unlocked, and they flood into your temple like a torrent. Legions will only flee the darkness, hide, and quiver in terror through him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. God bless you abundantly.